Ahoy, hoy, Welcome to Head Games, the science of psychology with sports. I'm Dr. Brett Levine, joined as always by Dr. Ben Rosenberg. Our guest today is the editor-in-chief of Baseball Prospectus, which is basically the Bible for baseball nerds, which basically makes our guest some sort of saint. Craig Goldstein, <laughs> welcome back. Thank you for having me. That's I, I guess Saints I feel Craig. I need to be a saint to be on the line. I'm not a doctor, extremely not a doctor. So <laughs> you're a saint. That's that's a lot better. Trust me. I think above. I think that's above a PhD. Yeah, yeah. You, you you can bypass all the coffee stains and the human tears. No, you're in good shape. Um, so you guys, okay. So this is weird. So you guys actually kind of like met and knew each other in Vegas at what was it, Thunder Down Under? Where were you guys at? Uh, first, it was Thunder Down Under, yeah. followed by what's the other one we were at, Craig? Oh man, it's it's hard to I don't I, I don't know the names. I just take it all in, you know. It all but all, all the dicks blend together. Man. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, there are so many signs. I just whoever's handing out something on the street, I just take it and <laughs> that's it. All the all the strip club cards, we just go with those guys. Hop yeah. in their limos. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Oh man. Well, uh, Craig, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm happy to. I'm sure you have many BP shirts <laughs> lying around the house. I've got a few. Yeah. We heard that, uh, and I don't know if this is getting too statsy for you, but I think it's not. Mm -hmm. um, we heard that in terms of like the best, the best prediction mechanisms in analytics that we're getting like 80 something percent variance explained. Like, um, you know, some of the best prediction models out there are like taking up major, major chunks of variance. Like, is that what you heard? Is it somewhere in like 80 something? Uh, I honestly, I, off the top of my head, I really don't know. Um, I can ask like, so I'm, I'm fairly like, you know, I, I have some facility with that kind of stuff, but I, I probably haven't read on like the, the hardcore projection stuff. We obviously do our own Okay. Um, and like we have a stats team and again if like you want to get into stuff with that I'd be happy to connect you guys with them but like Jonathan Judge uh, does a lot of our proprietary uh, analytics and we have a group of people but he he's kind of the engine behind them cool. and like we I don't know anywhere else that like for projection stuff for baseball we post our standard deviations um, and, hmm. and stuff like that throughout the year so that like you can see how wide and uh, how much how much certainty we have uh, around, you know, surrounding various uh, metrics that we provide. And That's yeah, because we try and just be kind of honest about like, you know, sometimes like we have, and, and that's not purely predictive, obviously, but our our proprietary sets like deserved runs created plus and, and deserved run average, those, those two especially are really good at being both descriptive and predictive. That's mm. kind of what they're built to do. And so because they're good at being predictive, we want to provide people kind of the uncertainty surrounding them so that when we say like, you know, this person is whatever percent uh, a better than, than league average, uh, you know, there's, there's an error bar there. And if someone else is within three, you know, we might be more confident of the guy who's worse, so to speak, than the guy we have is better. And, and that way you can weigh it yourself, right? We all yeah. look at these things and then say like, you know, there, there are assumptions built into all of them. There's variance that that gets you know adjusted for in all of them and there are different approaches for doing that and the reality is most of our users our readers um you know anyone who's using any of these advanced stats isn't digging into like the underlying philosophical approach okay. and thus hmm. it's necessarily going to say like you know it's like with anything with wins above replacement it's like oh this guy has seven and this guy has 6.7 that guy's clearly better well yeah. kind of <laughs> like you know there, there are a lot of reasons that might not be true um, and it depends where you land on like what the approach is. And it's not that one's wrong and one's right. It's just about how you want to go about weighing those things. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. So that wasn't a great way to, I don't know the answer to your question is the honest okay. one, but I can okay. talk a lot around. <laughs> That's good. Good enough. I think, you know, the, the, the basis of it was actually theoretical. It was basically going to say like, okay, let's say we can predict a big chunk. Let's say mm -hmm. like our prediction methods, especially for baseball compared to other sports. Yeah. Really impressive. How do we get to, do you think we can get infinitely close to hundred percent? And if so, are there other, um, are there other types of science that we should be including besides just using previous performance, like psychology or physics or biology, or like, how do we get closer to basically increasing our, our level of prediction? So, yeah, I do. Um, I do think we can get closer and I absolutely think that we should be using other disciplines in science like I'm a huge so this is a bit of a tangent but I just I do think it's moderately relevant like 
I'm a huge fan of um, behavioral uh, economics and that mm-hmm. like, that field in general. And mm-hmm. it's obviously the combination of two different disciplines, right? It's psychology and it's economics. And it answers things m- in a more realistic way than economics does on its own. Uh, yeah. I don't want to say it answers things in a way that psychology doesn't. I think it has a lot to do with, the, I think the value of it is applying the psychology to the, to the economics, yeah. because what we talk about when we talk about like a rational actor, and this applies to baseball too, right? It's, it's um, you know, we talk about baseball markets all the time and there, there are a lot of different ones, but we have to talk about like why, why and how teams behave in those markets um, and, and, you know, how, how they act, especially in, in this current place in time with these very with these let's say interesting off seasons it's all about what they think a player will do right it is projection that's what you're talking about they're they're relying on projection and we uh as an industry still rely mostly on um on how like we and we provide analysis based on what's been done historical like you're talking about Mm -hmm. uh because that's mostly what we have access to and teams i think there's there was a point that the public private gap was pretty small. And I think it's expanding a little bit uh, again with, with certain stat cast things, we do get things from stat cast from MLB, but we don't get the raw data as much and we can't build on the raw data the way that uh, hmm. kind of a huge hive mind of, of public analysts could in terms of making it better uh, or, or not even making it better, making the metrics that we can pull from it kind of better in that way. And so uh I definitely think to go back to your question, we can, we can improve by applying different disciplines. Um, when it's psychology, when it's, you know, these other things, it, it is biology. It is, you know, how we age, how people, you know, what is quick twitch versus slow twitch when you talk about scouting, what, you know, how do those age differently? When you look at someone's bat speed, can you, at a certain age, can you start having more confidence in your ability to predict that they're, they're going to have a slower bat, they're going to have to start cheating on pitches earlier. Uh, so that brings in their hand-eye coordination, their pitch identification, uh, that brings in their biology and their chemistry for like how their eye, how good are their eyes? How, you know, how good can you make their eyes via LASIK or contacts or things like that, right? Yeah. There, there are all those kind of spiraling things. So I do think we can get better and I do think we can get closer to, uh, you know, being actually predictive I never think you're going to reach it. And I actually think, I don't think it's going to be like 99th percentile getting closer, closer, closer. I think it's probably going to be about if you're, if we're going to say take 80% where it is, you know, somewhere between 80 and 85% because there are way too many things that we just don't have access to. And even if we did have access to, I find a lot of ethical conundrums Hmm. uh, in, in applying those types of things. And I'm sure that there's a there's a uh, a name for the thing, but you kind of put your thumb on the scale when you start uh, applying, cert- especially psychological things. I'm sure you guys could could educate me on that better than I can speak to myself. But like when you start applying or talking about like this is a thing that this guy is this situation is in. I mean, even as something as basic as like people start if a player starts hearing, oh, maybe he's a change of scenery guy. Mm-hmm. Well, he might start thinking, oh, maybe I need to change the scenery. It becomes self, you know, uh, self fulfilling prophecy yeah. type of thing. And I, I, I think those things absolutely exist on their own without people kind of influencing the players themselves. Um, but I don't know how you you start introducing them, you know, into into the surrounding culture, the surrounding conversation, without potentially changing those outcomes in in, yeah. in the process. Yeah. My, co- my colleague, uh, who's a professor at Chapman down in SoCal, who someday we're going to have on, did some research on something like what you're talking about. I, of course, can't remember the effect or whatever he called it. But basically, as soon as you, you name something, even if it's a statistic, it loses some value or loses some meaning. Right. right? So as soon as we started labeling saves or holds or whatever, they automatically lose some value simply by, by quantifying them in that way. Um, so I, I think you're, you're on the nose. I mean, the other thing that's involved is something that we talk about all the time. It's called measurement error, which is that you're never going to get to 100% because none of these measures are perfect, right? Some of these objective indicators that baseball is so fortunate to have are pretty close to perfect because they just are what they are. But as soon as you, you, know, you, you go away into any other field, anything we measure 
isn't perfect. Like as psychologists, nothing we measure is perfect. There's always some chunk that of what we're capturing that's error. So we can never get to 100%. Yeah, and the, and the math way of dealing with that is to normalize in some sense, yeah. you know, and you go back and do that. But there are, there are things that don't actually get normalized. I mean, you look at, if you want to track like the kind of the progression of advanced statistics in baseball, uh, let's just take pitching, for example, uh, there's fielding independent pitching, right? FIP. And it tries to, to isolate the things that pitchers are good at, uh, strikeouts, walks, and allowing home runs. Um, and there were always guys that would have uh, FIPs that would outperform their ERA. And people kind of at the time, this was, I want to say like, you know, maybe a little bit before 2010, 2008 to 2012, something in that range. Um, what's it? Matt Kane for the Giants was like a big one of those, if we're just remembering some guys. Um, and like he he was a guy whose FIP was always way better than his his ERA. Yeah. And it was because FIP and especially X FIP, which which neutralized a little bit further um, the park factors and, and home run rates and stuff like that. It applied a league average home run rate to to all the pitchers. Uh, the problem with that is that so so it's not a problem on a on a on a mass approach, right? Like it, it's it's probably fair because you're dealing with a huge data set and you're saying mm -hmm. let's we're gonna take the average uh, home run per fly ball uh, approach for all of these guys. And when you're trying to project forward, your mean, right, is that you're going to get closer to a mean on that. But where you're yeah. going to miss are, are on outliers. And Matt Cain was an outlier, but there was a reason he was an outlier. He pitched at the top of the zone before it was in vogue. He had a straight mm -hmm. fastball, right? Like guys could hit it. Now, guys often couldn't hit it, but when they did, it went very far. And so his home run per fly ball rate was often often very elevated and so you have someone who shows a skill set that is both good at limiting walks good at missing bats because he's pitching at the top of the zone but then bad at limiting homers and it mm -hmm. wasn't an accident so applying a league average home run rate to Matt Cain was wrong yeah, Matt, and you're mm -hmm. never going to be predictively accurate if you take that particular yeah. approach you have to get down into more of a nitty-gritty individualized approach to something like that but when you start to do that you lose other things right and so like predictive you know and, and again we deal with this with Pakoda, our projection system but there are others out there fan graphs uses one called steamer uh one called zips uh yeah. th th there's a lot out there you'll find, and, and they battle this too and and like dan zimborski who does fan graphs uh zips projections is really open about his process, but like, it's always a battle of like, you can get more correct when you, when you do start doing RSME, you know, you know, RMSEs and stuff like that. Um, mean squares. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. When you start, when you start clustering things around the mean, but is that, is that the most accurate way to do projections? Because yeah. now you're missing out on outlier, you know, Okay, if you if you regress Mike Trout towards the mean hard, you might be more right about everybody else because you're 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 clustering them, but you also know Mike Trout is not anything like the mean. So yeah. so you know, trying to pull him back when he's different. And again, there are a lot of guys that are different. Juan Soto is a is a straight up freak, right? You know, like pulling him back towards most 19, you know, what most 19 or 20 or 21 year olds do yeah. in their second or third year in the majors. I, it just doesn't work for someone like that. So you have to decide as a, you know, what your philosophy is in, in a, when you're trying to project forward and be accurate is how do you get the average guys around average and let the other guys, you know, who are yes, bad yeah. and good yeah. kind Oscillate. of. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of, so the, so the mean is like, I think a fair approach. I think it's a basic approach. We tried this. Remember Ben, when we were doing the Berkmont stuff that we yeah. tried like a prediction model with nfl players and we use euclidean distance and i don't know enough about that to talk about it yeah but the idea was instead of just taking like the the league mean that you create clusters so you don't compare mike trout to the average but you compare yeah. mike trout to players who are similar to him similar to him and then yeah. you say okay based on this cluster here how much you know how much more accurate could i be than just predicting to the mean there do you know of any um any modeling that works like that or how advanced is modeling getting in, in that regard? Or is it just really a trade-off? Like you said, like depending on your method, you can get 
closer or farther away. It just kind of depends on, you know, where the chips fall. So I'll, I'll say two things. I, I am a hundred percent, not the person to talk intelligently about that kind of thing. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Uh, You're, doing a really <laughs> You're doing a really good job. Um, yeah. Because I, I just like, I stopped taking, I don't think I even took a math. I took a stats course in college, right. Or in business school. I didn't take, I didn't take math courses in college. Like it's just, that's not, I, I topped out at a, at a, at a certain level. It was not very high, but like, uh, I do know. So we have, look, we have a stat, uh, a stats team. Like I said, uh, we have a Slack specifically for them. And like, have I seen them talk about stuff with that approach? You can, you know, the Euclidean um, distance and stuff like that. I have, I don't, specifically remember if it's what we use. Um, I don't think it is, but I do know what we do use. Uh, and again, this was kind of introduced uh, by Jonathan Judge is our, uh, we both deserve run created plus DRC plus and DRA uh, deserve run average um, use mixed modeling approaches. Mm. So he is, he is applying different models at the same time to, to try and separate those things and yeah. still provide that same thing. Again, I, the way I just said it, he would probably say, that's not exactly what I'm doing and, and here's how yeah. it actually works. But it is, it's a mixed model approach. I mean, we have, and we documented and it's all, so our website is is a su subscription site, but any research that we do, any anything that we do where we <clears throat> introduce a metric or anything like that is always 100% free because hmm. we want people to read it. We want to have uh, feedback on it. They produce everything that they do and that's kind of stuff through our um, mm -hmm. And so, like, if you have R, they give you the ability to go into a GitHub and you know, to, if run you the want, script. You can yeah. run those scripts and do all of that That's kind cool. of stuff. So, like, we we have explainer articles, and I'm happy to to provide them if you want to have links for people to to check them out or anything like that. So, th th those will give you a better understanding than I could possibly give you. Um, and I don't I don't think it's the Euclidean approach, but I do know he applies a mixed modeling approach to get the numbers that we that we get. So. It it's too bad because we're having so much fun and um, I want to get to this because I think it's important. 2020 was such a great year. Uh, 2021 <laughs> hopefully um, is a little bit better. However, in terms of baseball, I, I don't think it's off to the best start. We lost Tommy Lasorda. We lost Don Sutton and Friday. We lost Hank Aaron um, passed away at the age of 86, 755 home runs, 3,771 hits never tied to steroids, was always well-regarded. Craig, can you put into some perspective what we've lost? Honestly, I can't, like, I can't. And that's not, I mean, some of that is a reflection on me, I'll be honest, but, but mostly it's a reflection on who, and, and speaking specifically to Hank Aaron, who he was and, and what he did. Um, I'm not a great historian of the game. It's just never been my forte, but I mean, you look at what he did. Um, I, I was looking at it the other day. I mean, th and this is just the stat side, which is not, not close to the full picture of, of what Hank Aaron uh, did and, and who he was, but he, he led the league in OPS at 25 and he did it again with a better OPS at 37. And he had a better OPS at 39, even though he didn't lead the league in OPS that year. I mean, Jesus. he's, like the one of the most consistent performers there's ever been and that's from I mean he he never had more than 46 home runs which 46 is a lot to be clear or sorry it might have been 47 47 home runs but when you look at Barry Bonds for example who passed him had 74 in a season mm -hmm. so he got to the number he got to without ever hitting 50 home runs I mean that's and that's Crazy. It's staggering. Um, I mean, the consistency was just remarkable. And then, you know, I, I've kind of been seeing a lot more coverage and kind of trying to appreciate and take in the off the field things. When you talk about um, what he had to go through, where he had to do it, you know, what you, th there's been a lot of reporting about how his kids were uh, in, F you know, had the FBI protection when yeah. he was on the verge of breaking um, Babe Ruth's mark you know, the, what he had to deal with and he did it with, and, and I want to be careful here because it's very easy to talk about like dig, dignity and, and his, his quietness. He shouldn't have had to do those things, but he, he did have to have a quiet dignity because of the, the racism he faced, the threats his family faced, um, all of that sort of stuff. 
impacted how he chose to deal with it, but he shouldn't have been in that position to choose. Like there's nothing, there, there's no difference in his character had he been a vocal, you know, uh, uh, someone speaking out against it more more than he did. Although he did quite a lot, especially when he felt less threatened to do so, right? And you, you can look yeah. back at some of the things that he's given some amazing interviews. Um, if I Had a Hammer is a, an incredible book that, based on his life. And he talks about how like the threats that he got um, and the treatment that he received in pursuit of Babe Ruth's uh, record took, like he said, like I, it carved out a piece of my my soul, my heart that like, it just didn't come back for him. And he was just, the fact that he has, like he has so many quotes that are to me poetry about what he lost. And it's just, it is such a, by experiencing those things. And it's such a shame that we, you know, I don't know that someone as gentle and as good as he appeared to be. And, and we can get into this, I'm sure later, but like, there are so many things about, you know, don't have heroes, don't make athletes your heroes. And there are a lot of valid reasons why not to do that. Hank Aaron was like, legitimately someone you could have as your hero and never feel bad about it ever hmm. um and it's just i i can't i can't put into perspective what that loss is i i think one of the the best things i saw and i know i'm rambling so i apologize but one of the best things i saw was uh jeff heckelman who used to work with the league uh was talking about this on twitter and he said uh he was in charge of organizing kind of the the hank aaron there would be a Hank Aaron award presentation every year during the world series. And so, you know, he got to watch major league players kind of get ready before they were about to go up and talk to and meet Hank and, and go talk to him. And he said, at one point, someone kind of was like, do, you know, do, do I look okay? Do I, hmm. how do I, you know, am I am, like, is it on point? And he kind of just kind of chuckled and was like, yeah, you're fine. And he, the guy said, it's Hank fucking Aaron. And like, that's like to today's, stars that's what he meant to them mm. right? that's you had to look your best you had to be your best because it was hank aaron and like i i don't know a better way like that's you know one part of it it's just like as much as as jaded as we can be about our our star athletes and and stuff like that and and as much reason as they can give us to be that way um he was truly a hero, right? Like he was, he, he made them feel like a little kid. He, he installed that nervousness that we get in, in a lot of other scenarios in these yeah. guys who go out and perform in front of uh, tens of thousands of people every night. And yeah. I mean, that's just how big he was. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard for us to quantify, as you said, right? Sitting here in 2021, and we obviously were not around when he was breaking, chasing and breaking the record but hearing the stories of people who are, are, are either around the game or just were existing in that time period. Like I asked my dad about it actually this morning, if he remembered when he broke the record, he was like, he's like, yeah, of course. Like everybody from that era who was alive then remembers both the chase because here's a black man in the deep South chasing exactly. this hallowed record. And then also the, the moment when he broke it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think, you mentioned Don Sutton and Tommy Lasorda. I'm, I'm a Dodgers fan because my dad was a Dodgers fan. Obviously, they meant a lot to, to that franchise. Um, but it's just been – so we, we produce an annual uh, every year, a book that we finished in early, uh, early January, and most of the copy was done as of the end of last year. And one of our essays is Stephen Goldman, who is a historian of the game, uh, who writes at, at BP and, and was editor in chief before me, it's several people before me. Um, but he wrote about all the people we lost in 2020. Yeah. And it's just, I was talking to him, I said this about Don Sutton, and this is before Hank Aaron passed, but like, it is relentless. The amount, the institutional knowledge, the, the representativeness of all of these guys that, that we, lost i mean and and their legends i mean you know like darren sutton don sutton's son is is on uh xm or has been on uh sirius xm radio on the mlb network stuff like that i mean like these guys are drenched in baseball and and vice versa and it's i i don't know it's it's a stunning number of losses i mean we the the number i mean lou brock last year um tom siever mm -hmm. uh Rich, Rich Allen, uh, yeah, Dick Allen. I mean, like it's it's yeah, it's it's unbelievable. And 
you know, a lot of it is COVID related. Uh, that's kind of the spin that, that Stephen put on it uh, in our, in, in the book, but like, it's stunning to have written that essay and see the totality of it. And then immediately after we send it off to the printers, it's like, let's sort of Sutton, Aaron. I mean, it's yeah. just devastating. I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, I don't know. I, I don't have the words. It's, it's really tough. Yeah. As a baseball fan. And like, I don't know when I'd have this opportunity, but like selfishly, it's like, I never got to meet him. You know, I never got a chance to like, you know, see if I looked, I look at me, it's fucking Hank Aaron. I better look good, right? He'll shake his head or something like that. But a hundred percent. But you know, and, and I wanted to mention on Aaron, like this is the other thing is like you maybe you wouldn't, but like he was accessible for mm. the for, for being Hank Aaron, he was accessible. And mm. he also he I talked about his off-field stuff, but he also knew what he meant to people, what he meant to the game, but what he meant to people. And he carried himself in a way that was you know, demonstrative of, of what he wanted reflected, you know, what he wanted people to see him embody. He, January 5th, he was getting a COVID shot and he did it publicly. Wow. He, you know, he wanted to make sure that the people who looked up to him made sure that they understood like this was, this was a thing that they should be doing, that it was safe, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And that's, I mean, to the end, that's who he was. And the end, and he understood, you know, the power that he wielded as as a star and as someone who was respected for their civil rights, for their, you know, everything that they did off the field. Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, we'll talk a little bit later. We were going to play a, a Hall of Fame game, but it sure it and he has both of these things. Number one, he's got the stats, obviously. Yeah. But like, I also feel like, I think this is pretty much. I mean, I think this is pretty much a fact at this point that the Hall of Fame vote is also a vote on people's characters and more and more. <laughs> yeah, more and yeah. more. And it's it, and like if you factor both of those things in with Hank Aaron is kind of just like, can anybody get close? Like Ruth was yeah. incredible, but like uh, it's not really a great guy. I think cheated on his wife and just kind of, you know, yeah, Ty well, Cobb's a raging racist. I mean, yeah. there's all these instances throughout the history of the game. Yeah, yeah, we'll 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 come we'll come back to that thought, I think, in a bit. But I think a, a second sort of, I don't know if somber is the right word, but downer of a follow-up is this week, the other big interesting thing that happened in baseball is that the Mets had recently hired Jared Porter to be their GM and then fired him shortly thereafter, right after this story came out about him sending unwanted text messages of his private parts to a female reporter. So unfortunately this seems like it's probably not gonna be the last time something like this happens in baseball which is kind of an old boys club and i, I guess just wanted to ask if, if you had any thoughts about what it's going to take to change the culture like why are we still doing this yeah i mean i think that's a a complicated issue i i mean i so patrick dubuque one of our authors wrote about this the night it happened and i think one part of what he said really stuck with me which is that you know it's very unlikely that that's the last time this is going to happen and in all likelihood, it has already happened. The next one yeah. of these we find is something that's going to be, I mean, this was from 2016, 2017, right? right? This incident that, that just surfaced. So like in all likelihood, this is going, this is not only going to happen again, but the again is something that's already been perpetrated. Um, and it's not, I, and, and not to say that you framed it in any, um, ill-fitting way but like it's not just that it was unwanted messages of his private parts but like 62 i think yeah Ooh. consecutive yeah. texts that were not responded to i mean that's there's it's not worth drawing the distinction but it's all harassment right like yeah. 62 yeah. Straight texts that's yeah to me that's like clinical like what is i i don't even know how you go about explaining that and i think that's why they fired him like there's no explanation yeah. for that and there's no yeah. excuse for it and i should also point out that different circumstances but just for the mets the second straight off season that they've hired someone and then fired them before they actually did anything for the franchise right it's carlos beltran <laughs> carlos beltran was was hired as the the manager of the mets and then yep. the, the banging scheme uh scandal <laughs> unfolded and he uh, they fired him before he managed a game. So just a, a tough couple of off seasons for the Mets, but some, some of which I, I don't think Beltran they, they should be blamed for, but they, they brought on themselves. I, I thought Hannah Kaiser of Yahoo, Yahoo Sports, when, they're, when Sandy Alderson did a uh, press conference mm -hmm. following the firing, said, you know, did you talk to any women in the process of hiring mm -hmm. him? And the answer was no. Now, the, the answer is no, because the state of baseball is, what 
in terms of who he worked with, who are you going to ask for a, a, you know, he certainly didn't have any women that were bosses. You know, Kim Eng is the first general Mm -hmm. manager, uh, the first woman general manager in, in baseball history. That's this off season with the Marlins. Um, So you're not going to talk to anyone there. I absolutely think it's worth talking to people someone managed if you, when you're hiring them in that process. I, I don't know if he hired any, if he uh, managed any women or not. Um, and I also, I, I honestly don't know the answer on like, should you be asking reporters their opinion on, on a general manager hire? I, I lean towards probably not, but like, I, I would understand if someone maybe thinks that that's a relevant point to see like how they interact with the media or not. But I also think letting the media have impact on, you know, an influence on yeah. your hiring process. I don't know. I, I, I earnestly don't know the answer to that. And it's something I'd, I'd be, I'd be willing, very willing to listen to uh, people with, with various arguments on it. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of what it is going to take to change this, I think a lot of people say like, oh, hire women. And that's, that's a little bit of maybe the implication of what I just said. I don't think that solves it. I don't think, you know, there, there are women who, who are tolerant of things that they shouldn't be tolerant of too, uh, probably more sensitive than the, to, to things they, that, you know, like this than men, but you never know. And I don't think it's purely that. I think, I think you just have to, how you change a culture is something I've been super interested in. I, I went to, to like I, I mentioned, I was uh, I have an MBA. I went to business school, and I I was really interested in organizational um, kind of culture and philosophy. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that I found uh, the answer to to any. I I was very interested in like how do you create culture, and I never really there are all these case studies right about mm-hmm. culture. I, I read about Netflix four different times, um, <laughs> legitimately four different times about Netflix and their culture. But there's there's not a manual on like how to do it and how to influence it. And the best answer that I've, I've found as an editor in chief, someone who has, who manages people, who has, who has people that report to him, stuff like that, is to uh, act out the things that you believe in, demonstrate what you believe in. Um, at baseball perspectives, I, I was not the editor in chief at the time. I was the minor league editor, but I don't know if you guys are familiar with Luke Heimlich. Uh, he was a first round talent, probably a mid first round talent who went to Oregon state. He uh, was valued very highly uh, on draft boards and stuff heading into his draft year. Uh, but before the season started, it came out that he had a charge against him from like molesting uh, a young girl when he was younger uh, mm-hmm. And it came out, he, he was on a, um, I'm blanking on, but you know, like one of the reports that uh, you, you can get them, you know, a neighborhood watch yeah. them report, whatever, because he didn't check in with something, whatever, how we choose, to, how do you, how do you cover that? Right. That's a question as a, as a media uh, entity that we had to, you know, I was covering our, our prospect team, our minor league coverage. Like how, do, how do we want to approach that? Do you want to just talk about him as an on-field talent? Right. Mm-hmm. And ignore that. Do you want to always talk about him, but every single time provide context? Uh, do you want to not talk about him because, in your view, it is something that is disqualifying? And as much as people might be interested in how hard and how well he can throw his fastball and how well he can control it, that's really not what's pertinent in in this discussion. Our approach and I, I talked it over with kind of our senior staff on that side was to say we're not going to cover him that's just like mm. whatever whatever the league decides to do however wh- whether a team decides to draft him he ultimately went undrafted by the way um however the league decides to handle it however teams decide to handle it their motivations are much different than ours and their motivations tend to be about profit per, first and foremost and then how how well they can win and the intersection of that is like, can you get someone at a reduced price because of some horrible thing that they've done? And we've seen that with Rever- Roberto Osuna. We've seen that time and again. And so my faith was not in the league to handle this or, or in individual teams to handle this very well. And I said, I'm going to take it out of their hands. I don't want to talk about this guy. I don't want to give him the light of day. And and we had on staff, we've had people who were abuse survivors. And mm. talking about someone who had conducted themselves in this way and by the way pled pled guilty in this process uh, when he was younger so again so when he was younger 
uh, it was due to be expunged, that kind of thing, but like pled guilty to it. And that's what we know. Um, bringing him up, exposing them to that is, and, and you know, I understand certain people are going to react to this word, but like it can be triggering. Mm -hmm. it, and I thought the path of least damage is that like, I don't need to expose them to that to that. Now, other people handle it differently. Like I said, I, I know another publication said, we're going to talk about him, but we're going to bring this up every time. So people know who it is. I think that's a perfectly valid thing. All of this is, I, I know that's a tangent and I apologize, but all of that is to say, like, how how to change culture is to, to act on what you believe and to make sure people understand what went into the process. And for baseball and this this old boys club or you know increasingly like a new boys club like it's young they're young no i mean it is like it's you know it's a lot of people in their 30s ivy league educated yep. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. like it's it's very much like an old boys club but there's there's some new spins on it um i think you have to get good people you have to get people who are willing to to act on good ethical like frameworks and i and i talk about this all the time in terms of just the com competition aspect in baseball because teams are tanking teams are you know are, are manipulating service time things like that this is not good faith behavior and th this is not only not good faith behavior it's just abusive behavior but like you need people who understand that like the goal isn't the goal isn't the end right you know like it's the means like you have to do the means right to get to the right end and that subverting the means to get to the ends you want whether it's more wins whether it's uh more money whether it's a night with somebody none of that's none of that's okay and you need people who actively think that way and just will will act in good faith on all of those terms on all of the terms that they encounter you know what i mean mm -hmm. and and i don't know how to do it aside from from just changing the, because i think when you have leadership that does that people follow it and, and say, that's how I advance now, right? I, I reflect the, the values that our leadership and, and our ownership and all of that kind of stuff, kind of espouse and not only espouse, but, but walk as well. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it's funny, this came up a lot over the last four years for a certain reason is as a society, what do we value in terms of moral or ethical behavior and why, and why does it matter? And it's certainly come up in sports and, and you hit on it with Roberto Azuna. And I was thinking about Kareem Hunt and a lot yeah. of these players mm -hmm. to some really gruesome shit that are still given, you know, a, a podium and still given a opportunity to play because at the end of the day, people say, this is a fucking business and we want to yep. sell tickets and, and people's memories are short and you yep. forget. And I bet you, if you pulled people right now, a lot of people wouldn't remember what Robert, Roberto Azuna or Kareem Hunt did. Nope. And yeah. that's the trade-off, right? And I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's gruesome and it's terrible. And it's like, okay, fine. Like maybe it's a this philosophy of nice guys finish last, right? And you want to be an organization that runs yourself ethically and hires the right people and whatever. And, you know, in the end, it is about business and, and people's memories are short. But like, we can't, we just can't. I mean, I think like, we can't do this. We, we can't be, we can't say that a sport exists to spread joy and to make people happy. And yet here we are, you know, bringing up these people or allowing, you know, these people to exist. And to your point, um, triggering people, you know, or, or I think bringing up um, sensitive things that have happened to people and hurting, it should not be a hurtful thing, right? If, if, if it, I mean, I understand that like there's certain phobias out there. Like if you have a phobia of round objects, you probably shouldn't watch sports, but like, if, you know, I think if this is a pervasive cultural issue that you're right, like we just have to draw a line somewhere and say, you know, our athletes shouldn't be this way. Our president shouldn't be this way. Like there are effects beyond this as well. Like not just, you know, hurting someone based on what's happened to them, but also like, where does it go from here? Like what sort of deranged organizations do we allow to operate in this very, very crude, very cynical, you know, Heart, you know, like cold business environment, like, well, we're just trying to sell tickets. It's like, I don't want to know where that goes as a fan, as a human being, as an American, as whatever. I don't want to see where that ends up. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely well said. I, I wrote an article for SB Nation this year called It's Just Business, and it was based on obviously that phrase, but it's something I had been thinking about for honestly like a year and a half that I was just like struggling how to get into, you know, how to, how to go from one end to the other. But it is... It's essentially, I mean, 
it's essentially about capitalism and I'm not trying to, you know, look, you can get into whatever, again, like societal frameworks that you want, but like the end result, if you pursue pure capitalism is that like people lose out and you have to, you have to just like say like, well, tough shit for them. But like, when you talk about it's just business, like I, th there's this uh, quote and I'm probably going to butcher it going from memory, but um, from a, a former uh, chairperson of, of the board, uh, Anu Aga, uh, for Thermax was she, they were a chairperson and I it said basically like yes businesses exist to make money but they or I'm sorry yes businesses need to make money but they can't exist to make money and they basically said like you like we have lungs but our purpose isn't to breathe right mm. like our purpose as people is not to breathe but we need air to breathe right we need air and we need our lungs and we need all that to breathe but that is not our purpose similarly like a business needs money a business needs to make money but that can't be its purpose. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about sports, and, and this is something I think about all the time with baseball, and that's generally where I focus, but it's 100% true of the NFL, the NBA, all of these things. What is, what is the purpose? When, you, when, we, when we say, when we allow people to say it's a business, sure, yes, of course. But what are we saying about that? Is that does that mean we're just excusing them for devaluing people for devaluing how to you know how not only the like the people on their staff but how those people you know how people are treated all that kind of thing uh i think it is a shorthand for for all of that and i don't think it should be business we can have ethical businesses uh and 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 i, I also one thing i was thinking about when you were saying that you know people have short memories and and you know they might not remember what Alberto osuna did or or kareem hunt or i mean we're bringing up two names on. because we're for, yeah. you know, it, the list is so extensive that we might not remember, but it's not only that we have short memories. I don't want to put that on, on the fans or, or the consumers of, of these sports. It's because uh, there's, there are so many, I mean, it's overwhelming. How could anyone possibly keep track yeah. and keep and remember all of these things and then kind of devise a philosophical or societal approach that allows them to operate. I mean, this goes back to like, well, you want to look at like the, the lesson of the good place or whatever is like, essentially there's no ethical uh, uh, consumption under capitalism, right? Like every choice you make is potentially at the behest of a, a, a an unethical or bad actor in our society, because like there are a, there are so many and, and so many of them dominate various you know, means of, of production, so to speak. Um, but like, there, we need teams to be the guiding forces for us as fans. We shouldn't be in the position, I mean, it's, it's a lot like anything with COVID and how the government responded to it. People were, were forced to choose between like, do I you know, how do I deal with my work? How do I deal with my kids? What risks do I take? What exposure? A lot of those things shouldn't have been, you know, okay, so you're a bartender uh, and your your state said, yeah, we can have in in restaurant dining and, and people at the bars. That's, that's your career. That's your job. You're not getting money for it now. Uh, do you go work? You understand it's a bad decision. You understand that being inside based on the science says, uh, this is this is a huge exposure risk, and that people shouldn't do it. What is the choice? Well, the the reality is that that person shouldn't be in that position to make that choice. And my argument would be like, as fans, uh, we shouldn't be in the choice, be put in the mm -hmm. position of remembering the litany of people who have done horrible things and received chance after chance after chance, uh, you know, and and have to you know reconcile all of that ourselves. Yeah. Some of Maybe not all of it, but some of that should be taken care of by the ethical, uh, you know, ethical and good faith decisions being made by the teams that are are giving these guys these, you know, giving or yeah. not giving these guys these chances. Yeah, yeah. And, or and by just, Manfred, or by you know, right. yeah. th this is, and and you know, look, I, it's it's a very fraught process, right? Like the Osuna stuff, he he was suspended for a record number of games for something that he was not guilty of a crime on. He was not, look, I have no doubts about the validity of that suspension. Um, and, and I think there's something to be said about like the fact that like, should the, should he be eligible to play for major league teams? I think he probably should. Like you, there's, there was the crime, so to speak. And there was a punishment. He, it was levied by the league. He served his time. He's eligible. But I think the teams need to make a better 
set of decisions. And that doesn't mean never giving them a chance or whatever, but you, there needs to be accountability, right? Yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. that's the big thing to me with, yeah. with Osuna in his specific situation. He's always said, I'm not talking about that. I'm not getting into it. I'm refusing to do it. Okay, well then how do I, as a fan, give you any credit for, we talk about, I just said crime and punishment, but like, I also need you to like be a better person coming out yeah. of the other end of that. And I have no evidence that he's, he's, recognized what he did was wrong and ways that he's gone about to try and make not only make amends but or, you know it might be that he'll never be able to make amends with the person that he he abused and and that's that's their choice and i support them in that yeah but he needs to go about you know maybe he needs to speak to people you know at risk abusers or whatever and say here's how like not to act here's what happened to me learn from my story but we don't get any of that and yeah. then teams are still taking him in. And I think there's a market difference between someone who recognized what they did uh, and have made some effort to uh, correct it or to live better going forward. Some things are not correctable. I think we have to acknowledge that. Um, and and people who just say like, yeah, well, I can throw 98. So yeah. I'm back, baby. Yeah. You know, like yeah. whatever. Like, and, and that, again, that needs to be from the team. I shouldn't have to do that on my own. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you hit on this earlier when talking about organizations, right? If a company makes gazillions of dollars, but it pollutes the ocean, it erodes at the fabric of the planet and everybody else, right? And it's like, okay, well, we agree, we we have agreed essentially through laws that like, for the most part, that like organizations should not be allowed to do this, right? Like th there has to be the same standard within sports that it's like there's there's infractions and then there's things that erode at the essence of why we have sport in in the first place. And you put us in difficult situations like yourself. How, how do I bring this up? You're like I, I should not be put in this difficult situation. Right. Like there should be, you know, um, guidelines for this. A, a, I think this is similar, different topic, but like steroids is the same thing. Right. The, I think and I, I don't know this quite as well, but like in 2002, when you had the Miller report and you saw, if you were Bud Selig and you saw this big list of guys who were accused or tied to, you know, some sort of steroid, um, like, and you wanted to ban them or you wanted to punish them. It's like, okay, well then like there goes 90% of our revenue and you know, the league itself is then faced with a decision where it's like, well, we are a business though. And if I ban all these people, we're insolvent. So like, there's got to be like a point. I don't know if it's in the, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like here we are trying to solve the world's problems, which, you know, I'm sure people debated about, but like it, it's similar with steroids and, and even with remembering these players and honoring them in the hall of fame and then debates about what the hall of fame is. Well, the hall of fame is just a museum, right? And a museum documents history. So they, so they should be documented, right? Like we're, we're crossing so many lines here. I don't, I mean, I don't have any answers, certainly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think steroids are a really interesting point. So I'm, I'm like explicitly, I don't, I don't like on social media or, or in my writing really or anything, get into the hall of fame stuff, because I think it's just so, it's kind of so far sideways already that I, it's just kind of like not worth my time. So steroids, my opinion is that like, the number so we don't know who was using and who wasn't first of all i mean we have the report right but there are also people who are like if you talk to enough people in the game like you're, you're going to hear like a very high confidence level that a lot of people who weren't even on that report were using so like how do you how how do you separate one from the other uh it, because it was legitimately like it's the steroid era like how do how do you account for that? So are you not letting anyone in that era in the Hall of Fame? Um, you know, I I don't know. I don't really know how how to go about doing that. So my reaction is kind of like I think you just let them in and put context around it, right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean you have to give them a, you know, like there's a difference between like the plaques and the not. And like if you want to not give them a plaque, like I probably won't argue with you. Um, I, I it's just hard for me. Like like as with other things. There are multiple approaches here that I think could make sense. Um, but I also think like you want to go back to, you mentioned about Hank Aaron and his, you know, was never tied to steroids, but many people in his era use greenies, use amphetamines. And it it is, you know, like those guys are all in the hall and mm -hmm. they were not allowed and they used them. 
and it was about get you know getting some more energy for the for when you had a long long day long series whatever you took it you felt a little better okay well that's if you want to talk about effect like that's a lot of the, how a lot of us use caffeine you know okay are you we're not going to draw that line. I look, I think that's, a, that's taking it to an illogical endpoint to be very clear, but like it, it does, you have to like go through the whole process of like who used what and how and why, and who's already in and not, and all of those types of things. And I, I think it just becomes like impossible for me to argue against steroid users being out for me, other people are going to feel differently and they might say, expel the lot of them. And so be it. Um, I, I think that's a that's a potentially valid option as well. Um, but I think when you talk about, I mean, I think the Greenies thing is one of the ones I think people don't really interact with as much because a lot of their heroes use them. Gary and, Sheffield. Yeah, right. I mean, it's but it's one of those things. The the other part with with PEDs and steroids specifically is like you don't magically get better by taking them, right? So. One interesting way to look at it, at least to me, is that like they allow you to do more work, right? So what they allow you to do is re- your muscles to respond mm-hmm. faster uh, from, so like, let's Friday. say you you do a hard, hard day at the gym, right. then you take some steroids, some PEDs, yeah. and you get back at it the next day. Yep. You're actually yeah. putting in more work than other right. people to become better. Now, I think that's a a bullshit way to look at it and and to like sell it to people but there you can see the frame of thought there right you know what i mean like you can say like that person is actually in a way working harder um now again i think it's unethical it's against the rules you should not do it but to but people act like it's a shortcut and yeah. you automatically become very strong by taking these things and that is expressly not the truth yeah. um and then you get into like how helpful are they actually and the the reality is like, we really don't know. Right. For some people seemingly extremely helpful, for others, not so much. And weighing all of those things to me becomes, you know, it, it, this, there's a theme, but like weighing all of those things and, and having me be responsible for like interpreting all of that, I don't know how to do it. And that's kind okay. of where I said, I just like throw up my hands. I don't engage <laughs> with it very often because it's just like, it's so screwy. It's so sideways yeah. already that I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to weigh all of that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the broader theme in part at least is that if you look at everybody that's in the hall of fame, probably with very few exceptions, all of them did something that was not perfectly ethical, either in the game or out of the game. Right. Sure. Tons of pictures, pitchers for years have been doctoring balls in various ways. Sausage, yep. Right, guys have been doing weird shit on and off the field. So how do we just take, as you said, this one era that probably more people than were in the Miller Report were, were doing it, most likely, how do we just take this and say, well, we're going to throw the lot of them out, right? It sort of doesn't align, I think, with what's already in there. Yeah, I mean, I think... And, and it might not be compelling to people, and I, and I think that's okay, but my, my approach would be to put them in and say, here's the context under which this happened, and be okay. honest about what we know and what we don't, and let people make those choices for themselves. I mean, the reason these arguments are, are rehashed again and again, and, and for some people, not for me, but for some people, they're very fun, is that like everyone's going to interpret it differently. And I think that's, that's honestly fine, but I think they should... You know, I think there's a lot of sanctimony from baseball writers uh, and and the people who vote for the you know the Baseball Writers Association of America, the people who vote these people into the Hall of Fame. Um, I think there's a lot of sanctimony about that and a misunderstanding of kind of like what this is all about. And I understand it is an honor, um, but it it it's an honor that again, like relative to their peers in their era, like. I don't know how you you separate one from the other. I don't know how you segregate users from non-users when there's so much we don't know. And so it should really be about uh, doing our, and, and again, like the sanctimony to me comes in that like a lot of these guys were covering them, at the, the, the players at the time, the writers were covering the players at the time and not talking about it at the time. And it's like, you know, now you're now you're punishing them. And, and beyond that, like you get into, a lot of people, there's there's a very high correlation of people who vote for for Bonds and Clemens together or not together, right? Like they mm. see them as steroid era um, representatives and that kind of thing. And, you know, 
a lot of that is how they those guys in particular treated the media um there's a lot of like retaliation from media of guys who weren't kind to the media weren't generous with their time there's there's a lot of like personal grudges being settled in these things um and it's amazing to me you know we're talking about kind of a lot of these guys being bad actors in a lot of ways like Barry Bonds has a domestic abuse uh record um Roger Clemens has like a sleeping with a minor situation uh in his past um you get Mindy McCready like you can look that up the these like I think there are ethical reasons not to put them on the ballot uh or, or not to vote for them on your ballot uh but I struggle with those ethical reasons being like the sanctimony of they subverted the game because hmm. I, I I don't really think you know again in context that they did that um, I, I think that, you know, that should have been settled kind of at the time and not retroactively. And that if they got in, we should be very honest and clear about those subversive, subversive actions, right. but that, but that they're not, not a reason to not put them in, if that makes sense. Right. This is, this reminds me of Canseco's point, Jose Canseco who said like, Mark McGuire should be in the Hall of Fame because he saved baseball the year after the strike. The the home run race brought back so many fans and like Barry Bonds was just acting selfishly. And so those are two people who took steroids who really benefited from it, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the point you just brought up then, should should someone like Mark McGuire be more likely to make a Hall of Fame as as compared to like a Barry Bonds? I think... McGuire's statistical case is pretty lacking ultimately I mean he's got the the home runs but if you want to account what he did for baseball into that um I'd have trouble arguing with you I wouldn't weight it that that heavily but I do I think like he should I don't think he should have a plaque like he should be a hall of famer but he can be at Cooperstown I think he should be recognized for what he did for baseball you know what he and Sosa did for baseball um, at Cooperstown at the museum, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't think he is a Hall of Famer. Right. And that's maybe maybe a distinction without a difference to some people, and that's okay. Um, you know, that's it's a very thin line to walk, but that's kind of what makes sense to me. Um, but, I, but if someone said, I think those contributions push him into uh, uh, a place where he should be recognized with a plaque and he should have a Hall of Fame, you know, like, I don't weight it that heavily, but I, it's really hard for me to argue with something like that. I mean, it's an intangible thing, um, and we're all going to weigh that differently. Yeah, that's fair. Speaking of uh, doctoring the ball, um, going beyond the bounds of <laughs> what might be allowed, as well as um, what we consider to be ethical behavior, Trevor Bauer, uh, mm-hmm. the Cy Young Award winner, mm-hmm. is a free agent, and he's drumming up a lot of excitement about where he's going to end up. Um, can we get you to weigh in on, on if you had to make a prediction where, where Trevor Bauer is going to play next year? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there are a few potential fits for him. I'm going to say this with the caveat that like, none of this is an endorsement. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't earnestly think many of the teams, I think they care about a backlash to potentially signing him, but I don't think oh. it's going to matter enough to to impact their decision you know what i mean they're just gonna i don't think anyone's gonna say like well you know ultimately we can't do it because we think it's i i I think because of the reasons we discussed about how teams approach the game and the business and wanting to win although a lot of them also try not to win so it's complicated um i ultimately think it's not that big a factor his off the field stuff um and that it should be a bigger factor would is is my personal feeling on it but I think Toronto is is an option. They just signed George Springer. Um, they really need rotation help. And they've they brought in some pitchers. They just brought in, uh, they re-signed Robbie Ray after trading for him last year. They just brought in Tyler Chatwood. But their rotation is really, really weak behind Hyunjin Ryu. And he fits, like, for where they are as a team on the field, he fits mm. them really pretty well. I also think some of this is going to depend on whether he wants a major multi-year deal like uh, his nemesis, Garrett Cole, or (laughs) whether he wants to go year to year, like he talked about. And I think if he goes year to year, you could see someone like St. Louis being involved. 
uh, depending on, on how much he wants. Obviously, you'd take a higher annual uh, average annual value on a shorter term deal. Um, I think a team like San Francisco is is kind of interesting. They're not very right. They're not they're not there right now, but they they have a really good farm system in a lot of ways. A, a lot of those guys are pretty far off, but yep. they Farhan Zaidi has done a really good job of you know discovering Alex Dickerson, discovering, or not discovering, stealing essentially Mike Yastrzemski from the Orioles. Like these guys are legitimately good. Um, their last several major pitching expenditures haven't gone super well. Johnny Cueto, Jeff Samarja, that type of thing. But like what they don't have in the farm really is a ton of um, pitching and especially high-end pitching coming up. And so, you know, you've got Joey Bart, uh, at the major league level already. Uh, he's a really good catcher I, I, defensively. I, I think it would be a year, maybe a year and a half to two early for them. But again, if you're signing a six to seven to, you know, again, Garrett Cole got nine years. If you're signing a major long-term deal, you don't always worry about year one or, or year two. Um, the, the, complicated factor in that is that like usually year one and year two are the best years you're going to get for, for these type of guys. Yep. But, but it is, you know, you see teams do that with the nationals did it with Jason worth way back in the day. They signed him until he was age 39. They knew they weren't going to get the best years mm-hmm. of his career by the time that they were relevant, but they needed, they needed someone there in the meantime to start saying like, we're building something. Mm-hmm. I, I personally, look, I don't have any intel on any of this kind of stuff. I personally think San Francisco could fit that mold. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, for some reason that, that sticks out to me. I mean, look, he's, he's a potential top of the rotation pitcher. You can slot him in almost every, the Mets have been rumored yeah, to have right. interest in him. I think they also make a fair bit of sense, but contrary to the, to the Giants, they have a lot of pitching. Right, like yeah. Noah Slindergaard is going to come back at some point this year. They signed uh, Marcus Stroman to the qualifying mm-hmm. offer. He's there for another year. They, you know, they have Jacob Degrom, the best pitcher in baseball. Pitching is not where they're hurting, um, and so like, would he be a nice piece for a guy that's worth fourteen billion dollars and can spend whatever he wants? Sure, uh, but you know, if you're talking about strictly on field fits about teams that are coming up, and and you know the other factor for San Francisco is that they've brought in some driveline guys, especially on the pitching side. Yeah. And Bauer is uh, an avowed driveline uh, pitcher. So, I mean, I think, you know, there are, look, if Philly decided they wanted to spend, they could really use an arm behind Nola and Wheeler. Uh, and it would make a lot of sense again on the field. I'm talking about specifically. Um, and they also have some driveline people in house, I think more on the hitting side than pitching, but again, like, these are kind of ancillary factors and, and the base factors on the field only are that he's got a really, you know, the potential to be a top of the rotation guy and you can slot those types in almost anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, as giants fans, I mean, I'd say it'd be nice, a nice ad for us. I mean, as you said, we definitely, we have nobody at the top of the rotation right now, right? I mean, what Kevin Gaussman is going to be the number one and he's got good stuff, but you know, one, one year of kind of performance at this point. So. Yeah, and I and I really admire what Zaidi's. You know, I mentioned the hitters, but like Gosman, number one, they they made worth offering and him accepting the qualifying offer, and Drew Smiley, Smiley, yeah, 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 and got an eleven million dollar deal, which uh, shocking to me when that happened. But but you know, I I think I mentioned earlier, like teams pay for what they project, not what not what's happened, yep. and his velocity jumped by two miles an hour. If they if if Atlanta looked at that data and said we think this is sustainable, then they're paying for something eleven million dollars could look like a steal based yeah. on what he showed in San Francisco. Whether he can stay healthy, I would guess not. But yeah. you know, credit to to Zaidi and the pitching staff um in, in San Francisco for like turning those guys around. Gossman had sure. not figured it out in both Atlanta and Baltimore or Cincinnati. And Cincinnati has a really good pitching staff that again we were talking about Bauer, but like yeah. they, they took Derek Johnson, a coach from Vanderbilt and, and said like, we want you to use all the data and analytics that you're mm. using there here. And they turned Sonny Gray around and uh, yeah. Gray went to Vanderbilt. So some of that is that relationship. Yeah. And that mm. goes back to, by the way, projections capturing everything. Mm. How do you do that? You, right. How do you, 
if, if Sonny Gray went to another team that used analytics the same way Derek Johnson does, they have a different relationship. He, they, yeah. they, you know, so what he says, I could say the same thing and it's going to have a different outcome. Um, and, and my favorite example of that is Dave Stewart. You know, he was cut. He was cut from the Dodgers. He was cut from multiple teams, um, went to Oakland and he started working with, I, I think it was Dave Duncan. Um, and he said, like, this is the guy. Like, he's, I understand when he talks. Hmm. And Dave Stewart became a wow. two-time 20-game winner, Cy Young winner. Yeah, yeah. And it, that's about communication. And we've seen this with other – Liam Hendricks, who just signed with mm-hmm. the White Sox as a free agent, was in Oakland. And he was touting uh, this, this guy that he goes to who has a business called Codify – uh, about kind of oh, the yeah. way he the way he gives data and, and that kind of thing. And I've looked at the stuff, the stories that have, have talked about Codify, which I'm I'm at BP. It's I'm interested in that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is stuff most teams don't have, but he's communicating it in a way that these guys understand. And and Liam Hendricks said something that was really interesting to me. And I think frankly is a is kind of a bad look on Oakland. He said um he said the way that this guy Michael Fisher pr- pr- uh presents the information is all in a positive way uh he says throw it here you know throw throw these pitches in these spots these kind of things versus oakland who was saying avoid these areas don't Mm. do this don't do that Mm. and he said i i want to hear things in a positive framing and that that helps me understand it and like look it's hard to believe it's that simple but sometimes it's that simple that like this is the way his brain understands and implements things better um and and you know again how how do you project something like that well you you were talking about behavioral economics man i mean that's behavioral economics 101 is is framing and that's what you're talking about is like there's positively framed messages and there's negatively framed messages gain or loss frame messages and the positive framing what you're talking about being more effective at least for liam Hendricks tends to be more effective overall in communicating with people than the negative kind of framed message. So, I mean, it, it makes sense. All, all, and, all of what you're saying makes sense. Right. And that's something like you guys know based on what you study and all that kind of thing. But um, like, it's, it's, it's hard. Like I said, it's kind of a bad look to me on Oakland that like, first of all, yeah. like talk, if Liam Hendricks is cognizant enough to know how he better receives information, like that should be in, in, entrance and exit interviews, right? All this stuff should be tailored to the individual. I mean, you can take yeah. the same mass data and say like, our our big approach is this, but the smaller approach is the individual stuff is like, how are we gonna give that info to you? Yeah. And, and some of these guys are gonna say, I, I don't, I learn how I learn. Like, I don't know how that is. Yeah. Um, but some yeah. of them do know enough about themselves to say like, this is how I like to receive it. And the other thing For that sure. they should be doing, of course, is saying like, do you, you may like to receive it that way, but do you best receive it that way? I mean, those, <laughs> those are different things, right? Yeah. yeah. How do we, um, I, I think it's a great point. I think it was um, Ariel Cohen who said something similar. It was like, how do we catch up with this kind of stuff? And I think it was the bat. Um, Derek Cardi's, uh, mm-hmm. he takes, he tries to take in this information like, oh, this guy over the off season has been working on this, or he's got a new coach or whatever to try and factor into some of these, you know, predictive models. But like, you're right. You mentioned this earlier and you're a post positivist because we'll get, we'll get infinitely close to, but we'll never be perfect. We're always going to be chasing. I think these, these themes are the big T truth. We'll yeah. 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 We'll get close, yeah. but we won't get there. Yeah. Uh, this, my daughter is telling me from the other room that she's done napping. <laughs> she's banging, banging on the wall. Wrap it up. Uh, Craig, this was, uh, this was a lot of fun. We solved, I think uh, the world's problems. We covered a lot of deep topics. This was, I had a great time. This was so yeah. much fun. Likewise. This was really awesome. I'm happy to, happy to be here and, and happy to do it again if you ever need. Would love no to. Doubt. Yeah, definitely. Please, please rate and subscribe. Uh, we're applicable to the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks as always to our editing team for putting together today's show. Craig, you are on Twitter at CD Goldstein. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> well, you just did. <laughs> I just want to know, I want people to know what to avoid. That's fair. Yeah. Well, you, you do a lot of writing, so I think that might be um, better targeted material, obviously at baseball prospectus yep. We're on Twitter at head game psych. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Brett Levine, and you can find that guy on Twitter at BD Rosenberg PhD. And thanks as always for tuning in. Bye.